there's some material on some more profound topics that I'll just uh, touch on uh, very briefly. So I showed you a manuscript earlier that had part of the bottom burned away. Uh, this is the manuscript that we refer to as Tempus et Locus. It doesn't actually have a title, uh, but we uh, give it this term. Tempus et Locus means time and space. Newton was very interested in space from the point of view of his physics, but he was also interested in space from the point of view of his understanding of God's omnipresence. So here again, you can see how his science and religion come together. So he writes a series of points or questions in this manuscript. They're, uh, they're originally written in, in Latin. These, these are uh, English translations of those notes. That the substance of God is not present in all places or that the Jews more correctly called God place, Macomb. By the way, hope you're, hope you're not too shocked by this, uh, that is a spelling mistake in Hebrew. That's how you spell uh, Macomb. Um, so he spelt it with a calf, not with a uh, kof and the, uh, the vav there. That is the, these, even Newton made spelling mistakes. Uh, that is a substance essential to all places in which we are placed and as the apostle says, in which we live and move and have our being. That is an allusion to Acts 17 and 28. Is it more agreeable to reason that God's eternity should be all at once, totem symbol, snapshot view of eternity, or that his duration is more correctly designated by the names Jehovah? And, and then he does something very interesting. He takes this expression, ho on kai ho ein kai ho erkomenos, which is in Revelation 1, verse 8, he who is and who was and is to come, and he makes it one word. He just joins it all together as a title of God. He's interested in, in the titles of God, the names of God, and what they might tell about his um, his being. And what he believes is that God is present uh, throughout all eternity, almost as if God sort of fills uh, time. So it's a very high view of God. Now, I want to, uh, one of the last things I want to talk about is uh, the appendix that Newton added to the Principia. When Newton first published the Principia in 1687, it had one reference to God and one reference to the Bible. This is the 1687 edition. When he published the second edition in 1713, he had an appendix. It's about 1,450 words in the Latin. Yes, I did count the words. Um, and the first edition, and then the second edition is a, a little bit longer because he added to it. And this is a draft of this text. He called it the general scolium. And 58% of this text, the middle section, is pure theology. What is it doing there? This is uh, one of the published versions of that text. Well, what I did is I took the text in English and put it into Wordle, and this is what came out. Can anyone see what the dominant theme of the general scolium is? God. And yes, he does believe in one God, and there's an allusion to one God. Now you can see also that he's talking about planets, etc., etc. So, he begins the theological section. After talking about the solar system, he says, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. And if the fixed stars are the centers of other like systems, these being formed by the likewise counsel must be subject to the dominion of one. And he meant that in a non-Trinitarian sense, not a three-in-one God, but the Father only, especially since the light of the fixed stars is of the same nature with the light of the sun, and from every system light passes into all other systems. Well, here we see how Newton's very strict version of monotheism relates to his physics, because he believes if you have one God who creates everything, you're going to have a unified solar system, you're going to have a unified cosmos, the laws of nature are going to be the same everywhere. Whereas in a polytheistic system, you might expect that, you know, you have a god who is a god of a certain ballywick and principality who has his own laws and that sort of thing. So you can see how the monotheism relates to his, um, his physics and his understanding of gravitation. One of his followers produced this chart showing the beautiful system that he describes, the comets and the planets, and there's an English translation of the text we just looked at. And then he goes on, he does something that many people found quite peculiar. He talks about the nature of this God, and he describes him as a God of absolute dominion, and he begins to use a biblical language, the God of Israel, the God of gods, the Lord of lords, etc. 
And one of the things he wants to say is that the word God is a relative term. Now here we see Newton hinting at his anti-Trinitarianism in a public text. This is the only time he did it. 1713 and then in the third edition of the Principia, 1726. I'll just very briefly outline his argument. What he's saying is that Trinitarians, when they see the word God used in the Bible, they take that word to denote substance. So when that term God is used of Christ, they take it to mean that Christ is being described as having the same substance as the Father as in the Trinity. Instead, he says, no, it's a relative term. It's defined by its relations. So when you say God of Israel, that's a relative term. God's not just God, you know, in, 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 in infinity, etc. He is God of something, right? He's God of Israel. He's God of his people, uh, etc. He has a dominion. And he says in this text that a God that doesn't have dominion is not a real God. Who are those gods? Those are the false gods of the Gentiles. Those are idols. They don't have dominion, so they're not real gods. So his notion of God is directly connected to his notion of rule and sovereignty. God is the absolute uh, monarch. So he moves away from this Trinitarian conception, which is based on Greek philosophy and notions of substance. The relationship between Christ and God is not one of substance, for Newton, but rather it's one of shared sovereignty and derived sovereignty in the case of uh, Jesus. And so he quotes some passages where he says, look, you can see that uh, in the Bible, Psalm uh, 82, for example, the Hebrew judges are called Elohim, they're called gods, but that doesn't make them God a very God in the sense of the Nicene Creed. Uh, they're representing God, so they have that title in a relative sense or uh, in an official uh, sense. Okay, there's more on this, but uh, let's just move through uh, to the end. Some other hints of his anti-Trinitarianism, that God is a one indivisible person, God is one deus et unis. It's all there. He doesn't come out you know, explicitly, but there were people in Newton's uh, lifetime who actually recognized that he is attacking the Trinity. So this is the most famous book in the history of science, and there is an implicit attack on the Trinity uh, in it. This is a list of 12 articles, or 12 principles, 12 statements about God and Christ. And what he wants to do is he wants to determine the relationship between God and Christ. Newton, early on, in the 1670s, when he was a young man in his 30s, began to realize that the doctrine of the Trinity is not taught in the Bible. Now, to put this into perspective, the Trinity in the 17th century, as it is for many Christians today, is the chief doctrine of orthodoxy. Right? To reject that is to be considered a heretic. Uh, but this is exactly what Newton did. Now, he never went fully public with this. He, he hints at it later in his life, in his, in his Principia. But for the most part, he kept this uh, private, although he did preach to people that uh, he knew in private. Okay, so let's look at some examples from this. And I'm referring to this as Newton's biblical Unitarian theology. So when I say Unitarian, I just mean that Newton believed that God is one person, not three persons. So don't confuse this with the modern group Unitarian Universalism, uh, which um, is you know, a very liberal group and they include people who aren't even believers. This is referring to his view of God. So Article 1, and you can see this on your handout, there is one God, the Father, he first wrote eternal, then he crossed that out and replaced it with ever-living, omnipresent, omniscient, almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So when you look at this, the, the handout, you'll see that I've underlined the portions that are from the Bible. So it's laced with uh, biblical language. This first article right here alludes to 1 Timothy 2 and 5, which uh, Gordon read for us uh, earlier. And this was a very important passage for Newton because he believed that it showed that the Father alone is God. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man uh, Christ Jesus. So he believed that Jesus was not God. At least he was not God in a substantial or essentialistic uh, sense. 
He believed that Christ could be called God, as Christ is maybe four or five times in the New Testament, but only in an honorary sense, not in the sense of Trinitarianism. You also see that he's alluding to the opening words of the Apostles' Creed. If you read the Apostles' Creed, you'll see that it's entirely biblical, although it doesn't, it's not part of the Bible, but it's based on uh, biblical teachings. Article 2, the, the Father is the invisible God whom no eye has seen or can see. All other beings are sometimes visible. So as he moves on to Articles 2, 3, and following, you see that what he's doing is he's showing some distinctions between God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. There are certain things that are true of God that are not true of Christ. And so God is invisible. Other beings are sometimes visible, and this includes uh, Jesus Christ. So this passage is influenced by Colossians 1, verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. So he interprets that to mean that Christ is not God. Christ is not the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God. Now, I say that Newton interpreted it that way. I think that the verse actually does uh, say that. Also, 1 Timothy 1, 17, and 1 Timothy 6 and uh, 16. Now, he does this in other places. So a manuscript which is now held in the National Library of Israel in Jerusalem has another list of 12 points. They're slightly different, but the basic idea here is that only the Father is God. God on the, script, on the scriptures is never used to, he crosses that out and then writes, the word God is nowhere in the scriptures used to signify more than one of the three persons at once. This manuscript probably dates from the 1670s when Newton is sort of coming out of Trinitarianism. So you can see that he's still kind of using some of the language of Trinitarianism, even though he's beginning to realize that the idea of three co-equal persons is not biblical. So then he goes on to say, the word God put absolutely without particular restriction to the Son or Holy Spirit that always signify the Father from one end of the scriptures to the other. Whenever it is said in the scriptures that there is but one God, it is meant of the Father. So he concludes that references to the one God only refer to the Father. Now that is a non-Trinitarian perspective, right? Because in the doctrine of the Trinity, the one God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Newton comes to reject this, and he rejects this not on philosophical grounds, but on biblical grounds. It is the proper epithet of the Father to be called Almighty. For, God Almighty, for by God Almighty, we always understand the Father. Yet this is not to limit the power of the Son, for he doeth whatsoever he seeth the Father do, etc., etc., using language that comes from the New Testament. So he doesn't believe that Jesus is a mere man, just a, a, a really good teacher. He believes that Jesus is literally the Son of God, but he does not believe that Jesus and uh, the Father are of the same substance in uh, the one God. So he comes to reject that, and he rejects that almost certainly by the 1670s, so about a decade before he writes the Principia. Okay, so that's uh, the Trinity. Now, Newton, as I said, uh, the model I'm presenting is that he's coming out of orthodoxy. He never completely comes out in every respect. So some uh, of you might be thinking, what did he think about the pre-existence of Christ? Well, it seems that for most of his life, he did retain a belief in the pre-existence. But as he got older, and as he began to uh, read the works of the Polish brethren, otherwise called the Socinians, who don't believe in the pre-existence of Christ, that is to say, they don't believe in the literal pre-existence, they believe that Christ pre-existed in the mind of God uh, only, you can see Newton begins to vacillate. And he's not entirely sure whether he wants to claim that that is a doctrine that has to be uh, accepted. So there's a gradual retreat of the importance of the preexistence, although maybe he continued to believe in it up to the end of his life. It's very, very difficult. Unfortunately, Newton wasn't writing for 21st century uh, theologians, he was only, or scholars, he's only writing for himself and some of his friends. So he doesn't give us all the answers to all the questions we might want to ask.